Candyland's a 2023 horror thriller produced and directed by John Swab, starring Olivia Lucardi, Sam Quarton, Owen Campbell, and Alec Baldwin's brother. Some people thought this movie was a supernova of CD cinema, and other people thought it was a vile, disgusting film with no redeeming quality. Let's get off at the next exit ramp and take a closer look at the plot of Candyland. The plot. The movie opens at Christmas time, 1996, with a scene I can't show you here on YouTube, even though you can find far worse than this here on YouTube. So I suppose what actually matters is who's posting it and not what's being posted. Sorry, 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 you're right. You're right, I didn't mean it. I apologize, sorry. The story focuses on a group of prostitutes and takes place exclusively at a truck stop aptly nicknamed Candyland. There's Sadie, Riley, Liv, Levi, and the boss lady, Nora. The premise is simple enough. The gang pays the bills by servicing various and sundry passers-by, typically in the form of truckers. The group's tight-knit and well-organized, and in terms of performance, each of them seem proficient and professional. Five minutes into the movie, the gang's approached by members of a local religious cult. They're laughed off the lot, but not before leaving a few pamphlets behind. One of the pamphlets ends up in the hands of Sadie, who does not throw it away. Sheriff Rex arrives, played by Alec Baldwin's brother, and he's sympathetic to the group's plight, mostly because he utilizes Levi's services from time to time. And if I was a stereotypical American truck stop prostitute named Levi and Alec Baldwin's brother pulled up on me, I'd be all like... Quit calling me that. Can't you be creative? Come on, Levi. Which one of them Baldwin's is he again? Horatio? Looks like Horatio. When they get all y'all into the same room at the same time, y'all look identical, but really different at the same time, like, like a collection of soccer balls all inflated to wildly different pressures. Get in the fucking truck, Levi. Well, I reckon I should do what I'm told then, as I don't want to be shot in the chest on a movie set by a member of Hollywood's royal family now, do I? Sadie finds one of the girls from the cult sat around the back of the hotel by herself clutching a big wooden cross. She says her name's Remy and apparently the cult booted her out. While that's going on, Riley finds a dead guy in the toilets with his arms folded across his chest. Sheriff Alec Baldwin's brother does a half-assed investigation and decides to do nothing beyond delivering the body to the morgue. Out of the kindness of her heart, Sadie lets Remy crash in her room until she can figure out what the hell she's doing. The next day, they head to lunch for some get to know you chit chat. The gang helps Remy understand what they do and why they do it. When they ask her if she'll be going back home soon, she tells them she can't. While Remy's waiting outside for Sadie to finish her current project, Nora invites her in for tea and a talk. When she's inside, Nora uses her madam magic to talk Remy into working for her in a scene reminiscent of another thing I'm not allowed to reference on YouTube. And in that context, it's a very creepy scene. Once she's accepted the position, her new crew gives her the lowdown on how to get down low. Think of it like a Rocky montage, only instead of protective gear and meat pounding, it's, um, well actually, it's exactly like that. They get Remy up to speed on a few of the golden rules and then they give her a room of her own. While she's settling in, poor Levi gets graped around the back of the truck stop, but he gets his own back when he beats the assailant to death with a pipe immediately afterwards. And while that's happening, Remy gets her first assignment and what do you know, he's a priest and a friggin' ghoul one at that. He takes his teeth out to deliver his CD sermon, and while he's doing that, she breaks his neck somehow. Sheriff Alec Baldwin's brother arrives to take a statement from Levi, and he concludes the man he killed must have been the same person who murdered the man in the toilets at the start of the story. So he congratulates Levi for doing a good deed. They make off together to ditch the body. And if you thought the priest was ghoulish, wait till you see Sheriff Alec Baldwin's brother having a go. The cult leader inevitably returns to speak to Remy, and they have a private theological logical discussion. We learn his name's Theo, and I for one call bullshit on naming him that John Swab. Either try harder next time to come up with a name, or maybe don't try so hard. We also learn they booted Remy from the cult because her views aren't in line with theirs anymore. Theo tells her they're all leaving tomorrow morning and invites her to join them if she decides to get on board with her thinking again. So she preys on it. 
invites God to guide her hand. The next morning, a new client pulls in and Remy decides to handle it. And with every new scene, it seems director John Swab manages to up the creep factor exponentially, as this guy gives Jack Earl Haley's character Ronnie in Little Children a run for his money. And if you haven't already seen this one, see it. God does end up guiding Remy's hand as she drives a knife concealed in her cross into the trucker's throat. While she's cleaning it off in the bathroom, Liv asks her what she's doing with it. So she kills Liv too. When a random woman in the bathroom overhears Liv struggling in the stall, Remy kills her. A few minutes later, Levi treats her to lunch with a snowball. He asks if she's single. She says yes. Before the conversation gets any more interesting, Remy's called away to work. When the man tells her what he'd like, Remy tells him he needs cleansing. By this point, you've probably figured out what she means by that. So the police and the paramedics arrive again and Sadie's devastated to hear they found Liv dead. Remy pays a visit to Levi next and after she's cleansed him to death, she visits Nora, then Riley, and finally Sadie, who is ironically in the process of leaving her sins behind for a better life. And after she's finished God's work, Remy showers away all their sins, but not before she leaves the requisite red right hand on the wall, which is technically another example of excessive symbolism, but we'll let him off with it. At least he didn't play the song over top of the scene. On a gathering storm comes a tall, handsome man in a dusted black coat with a... I completely forgot. You're absolutely right. Copyright won't happen again. Promise. With the red right hand. Sheriff Alec Baldwin's brother finally arrives and he finds Remy crying on the floor. So naturally, he assumes his brother Alec did the killing. So he drives Remy home, but home's a far worse crime scene given the rest of her cult has already left. And when I say left, I mean to heaven. Devastated and inconsolable they left without her, she drives her cross into her own chest and bleeds out into oblivion on the floor to the sound of Crowded House's epic 80s chart-topping track, Don't Dream It's Over. There you have it, folks, the plot to Candyland. Let's get ourselves a look at the righteous bits. The good bits. In an interview with somebody I'm not familiar with, the director John Swab said his resentment for the lack of excitement generated by modern horror movies motivated him to come up with this story. A lot of horror fans are feeling the exact same resentment. So hats off to John Swab for actually doing something about it beyond whining, complaining, and bitching and moaning on some YouTube channel. Oh, I know. I wrote the script. I never thought I'd see the day I'd describe a slasher movie focused on a group of truck stop prostitutes as refreshing, but for the most part, this movie feels sincere and free of bullshit. I've racked up thousands of miles day tripping around America, and if you've been fortunate enough to spend time there yourself, you'll know this movie captures this aspect of Americana about as well as it can be captured by a camera. There's a grimy filth in the grain of this film beyond the characters' professions. The tone's gritty, and there's potential danger right around every corner that might come from a stranger or even a supposed friend. The acting drives the realism even further. These characters do not behave like actors. As a reminder, that's meant to be the goal of every actor. Their conversations feel easy the way conversations should be between friends or casual acquaintances lacking certain social graces. On a lighter note, I really appreciate the thought put into the soundtrack. The movie opens with Perry Farrell's We'll Make Great Pets and closes with Crowded House houses don't dream it's over. In between, he used Silent Night and Joy to the World as festive musical interludes between the murders. In the grand scheme, they are little things, but it does show you thinking about the details. Having said that, the shite bits. There's a great story idea at the heart of Candyland, but it didn't fully make it to the screen. Remy's motivation was questionable. She had intimate physical interactions with the people she deemed unclean, and that confuses things. The killings themselves were clustered together in a way that robbed each of them of their individuality, which would be a bizarre observation were this not a horror movie. Also, for a movie full of frontal nudity and graphic depictions of physical intimacy, they held way back on the actual murders. If they kept the camera on the kills, 
kills the way they did on everybody's private parts, this would have been one hell of a slasher flick. And finally, for me, they showed their hand far too early and it baffles me why they did. There was an obvious tension here they could have teased out by hiding the killer's identity until the end of the film. They nailed the difficult bit by introducing Remy as an outsider in a perfectly believable way. Then they went to the trouble of obscuring her true intentions with subtle, deceptive language and completely believable acting. They could have kept the mystery going right up until the end, but they took the quick and easy off-ramp and it leaves you feeling like you left the highway before the trip even got exciting. The verdict. So, should you watch Candyland, or should you give it a polite toot on the old horn and keep on trucking right past it? If you haven't seen it already, yes, I would recommend checking it out. It's not without its flaws, but it comes at things from a bit of a different angle, and variety is always a good thing. If you have seen it, let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below. And if you like this video, hit the like button, consider subscribing so we can do this again sometime. Until next time, folks. It's me, Johnny, from that thing you just watched. If you enjoyed it, go down there and smash me in the face to subscribe. And if you want to watch another thing, there's one right there. Do it! <laughs>